Good afternoon, Heritage. I thought we'd be in the church today at 2 p.m., but the weather has dictated otherwise. We did a drive-by this morning uh, by the church. Brother Larry uh, reported back and said that uh, pretty icy conditions in the parking lot, some snow coverage. So out of uh, caution to keep everybody safe, we decided to de deliver our message here online this morning. And also a couple other members of our church family posted on social media I saw uh, this morning regarding uh, conditions at their home here in Blandon. Ice covered uh, Miss Ann Pruitt. I uh, saw a post from her that her entire driveway had was covered in a, in a sheet of ice with a light dusting of snow on top. Very treacherous. So we wanted to be safe and cautious. It's very icy here where we live as well, right down the road. I'm going to start this morning by going over our prayer list. Just some names that we want to mention. In addition to those names that we've been praying for, uh, we want to also keep in, in mind these uh, these new names. And that is Sam Barton and Hunter and Logan Barton, Skip Dalton. Uh, Loretta, Susie Gregory, and her son, Michael Gregory. Michael is still dealing with some very serious health issues. Alexis Huffman, Mara Ramey and her family, and Brandy Tyere. They're the new names we have in addition to our normal prayer requests of Chris Allen and Tina Cecil and Dee Cunningham, Foster Freeman, David Hatfield, Sarah and Jimmy Pauley, uh, Betty Peters, Corey Reardon, Kavita Reynolds and Roxanne Rowland, Susan Williamson, Chris Wolford, and Ray Woodward. Keep those names in our prayer. Yes. Prayers also. Uh, our church family that need prayers, uh, Tina Dalton, Ms. Ruben McCroskey, Brother Buzz, let's keep him in our prayers, Gary and Sylvia Sadler. Just uh, heard from Miss Sylvia the other night uh, and uh, communicating with her there on Facebook Messenger and uh, keep Brother Gary in, uh, in our prayers as well. I miss Sylvia too. Brad Sargent, let's keep him in our prayers. I've been uh, emailing back and forth with Brad on and off the last couple of weeks, and he is uh, going in for a procedure in early February. Hopefully the doctors will be able to get a better grasp on what he's dealing with and what they need to do to, to get Brad back uh, restored to health there. Yeah. Also for those families in bereavement, our church family, as you know, um, lost five uh, precious members of our family in December as we uh, battled uh, this coronavirus as it swept through our church. Of course, Brother Doug Green, Miss Elsie Major, uh, Miss Diane Reynolds, uh, Brother Carol Reynolds, and Miss Alice Nelson all, all passed away. Um, we'll be mourning their loss. They'll leave a giant void uh, that uh, we'll be hurting and missing them for, a, for, for quite a while. But we can take joy and comfort in the fact that know that they are rejoicing in the presence of their Lord and Savior. Uh, they're with Jesus right now, and it uh, doesn't help us down here as we grieve and mourn uh, their, their passing over to uh, their eternal home. But uh, certainly as we focus on that, God will send a peace and God will send a comfort. So let's keep in prayer. Miss Wanda Green, uh, pray for her as she mourns the loss of her husband, Brother Doug. Pray for his children, his grandchildren. Uh, please pray for Miss uh, Elsie's family, Brother Bill and Miss Vicki, Sam and Nathan, and the rest of her family there as well as they uh, grieve and mourn. And uh, also pray for the Reynolds family and the Nelson family. And they lost three members uh, just in one month. And uh, Miss Alice's son, Willie, uh, asked for prayer. So please keep Willie Nelson in your prayer. Let's, let's lift him up and pray that God works in his life, and God sends him a peace and comfort, gives him wisdom and discernment as he uh, battles with the, with the loss of his mom and his sister and his brother-in-law. Uh, so let's keep those families in our prayers. Well, those with uh, long-term needs on our list, you have our prayer list. I'm sure you have a copy of that. Uh, pray for our community. Pray for uh, all the world leaders. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, that we, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, excuse me, that we need to pray for all world leaders. And we can live a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. And it's uh, the fear is uh, that maybe that could become more and more difficult, but living uh, godliness and honesty is not an option for a believer. So we pray that we can live out that life as we're called to live and walk worthy of our calling and live out our Christian lives in all quiet, uh, in, in, in quietable, in, in quiet and peaceable circumstances. So let's pray for that. Pray for our president. Pray for our military and our law enforcement. Pray for, again, our country and a lot of turmoil, a lot of uh, uncertainty. And we know that uh, God is in control. God is in control. Nothing surprises God. And uh, 
We need to understand that. Pray for our missionaries, Roger Blevins, Michael Henson, Jason Severs, Travis Sharp, Jason Thomas, Chuck Weber, Patrick Wolf. I, this morning, I, I, uh, my wife received a text from uh, Miss Tina, and Pam told me that uh, she heard that learned that Travis Sharp's uh, dad passed away. So let's pray for Travis Sharp and his family, that God sends peace and comfort. Also, I received a message early this morning that one of my cousins back in Maryland uh, passed away unexpectedly. Let's keep him, uh, Ray Powell, that's his name. Let's keep uh, his family in our prayers. I'd ask that you pray for them. Uh, also, I mentioned uh, the last couple of weeks, there was a woman, a friend of our family, named Sharon Marconi, who was on a ventilator and uh, battling COVID. And pray for her. Understood they're going to do some more medical procedures, do a tracheotomy. And uh, it's, it's a delicate situation. Just keep her and her family in in our prayers as well. And all those battling with this illness, I'm sure we all know someone that's dealt with this virus and, and will continue to deal with that virus. So all of those requests, let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this day and everything you've given us, Lord. I look out my window this morning and I see snow, the beauty of your creation, Father. And I'm just so thankful for all that you do. Thankful for our church, Lord. Thankful uh, as we worship and as we praise you, Lord. And thankful for your mercy, your long-suffering, Father, and your grace, your love. Father, we lift up all of these names on this prayer, li uh, prayer list to you this morning, Lord. Those that have health issues and are battling health concerns, Father, we lift them up to you and commit them to the care of the great physician according to your will. Lord, I pray for those that are dealing with mourning and and loss over their loved ones and their family and their friends. Father, I pray that you give them comfort, that you send a peace that passes all understanding. Lord, you are the comforter, God. Lord, those that are cast down and downtrodden and dealing with depression, and, and uh, Lord, you are the great comforter. Father, I pray that you help them stay rooted in your word, seek the truth of your word regarding what you have to say about the comfort you give. Lord, I pray you be with our services today. Lord, have me say everything you want me to say, nothing you wouldn't have me to say. Lord, I need you this morning. It's difficult, Lord, to deliver a message when we're not in your house, Lord. But we know that you're with us. Be with our country. Be with our community. Father, be with our church. And we ask all this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, well, amen. So we were going to continue uh, last week, we were, uh, was thankful that we could get back to a little bit of normalcy in our church. We had a great turnout on Sunday afternoon. It was great seeing so many folks there. And uh, we got back into our message into how to stand in a stable place. And uh, we kind of uh, preached that message. And as we got it a little deeper into the, the, the message, uh, I kind of rushed it a little bit, jumped to the end because it was really the Lord put on my heart that I wanted to get to the end. I wanted you all to see the result of what happens when you... Uh, stand in a stable place and when you are thankful in the thick of it. And we went through a uh, an incredible uh, uh, service. It was, again, it was a great turnout. Great to see everybody there. And uh, we're going to continue this morning. I, I was about ready to go to that next step uh, to stand in a stable place that Paul talks about here in, in Philippians. Uh, but I want to do that when we're all together in person and and uh, so this morning, I'm just going to finish what I what I didn't finish last weekend. And if you have your Bibles, so hopefully you do, turn to Philippians chapter 4, and we will begin reading. Uh, starting in verse 1, the Bible says, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, and long for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. I beseech Eodius and beseech Syntyche uh, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labor with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. And those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. It's Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. So we're, we're heading up... Uh, 
the stairs there and to our step by step to these steps Paul gives us to stand in a stable place and just looking this is a this this idea uh, and this principle of standing fast and standing uh, in spiritual stability and standing fast and being in a stable place is very scriptural when when Paul wrote his first letter by the way to the Corinthians uh, he says in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 58 be ye steadfast unmovable always abounding in the work of the Lord Paul was telling the Corinthians, he was calling them to a stable place, to be in a, a stable place spiritually. When James wrote in James uh, chapter 1, verse 8, when he says, a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. James was referring, of course, to spiritual stability. And when Peter wrote in, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10, but the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you, Peter was referring to spiritual stability. And John, when he writes, and he says, I have no greater joy, this is in his third epistle, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. He's speaking of the fact that those in the church are walking in a stable place. So all kind of examples throughout Scripture to show that this theme of spiritual stability and being in a stable place is, is, is carried throughout the New Testament. And over, over and over again, we read that we as believers, and you and I as, as Christians, are, we're called to be faithful and to, to be stable and strong and consistent and bold and courageous and unwavering and not to compromise. And uh, this gets really to the heart of, of living our lives as believers, as living our lives as Christians, when the, kind of when the rubber meets, meets the road. God's call upon us is that we should be stable and firm and strong. I think back to our study in Ephesians. Uh, we know there's a war. There's spiritual warfare. The world is, is launched an all-out attack, and so is the, our flesh, and so is Satan. And that's a spiritual battle. And one thing I, I said when we walked away from our study in Ephesians there, Ephesians chapter 6, I said there's one thing we need to realize through all of this is that we are in a war. There's a, a true battle going on, and... and uh, what the what that persecution and hostility and, and all this rejection and these trials and these temptations, all those things that come against us, their, their goal is to uh, strike at our knees and knock us down and topple us over and to make us unstable. To do uh, the devil wants every, to do everything he can to make us uh, in, uh, unstable and to not be able to stand in a stable place. So Paul here in Philippians, his call. Uh, to us as believers into the church of Philippi, and by extension to us as believers, is to stand fast in the Lord. Very similar to his call in Ephesians chapter 6, we need to stand and withstand and, and uh, stand in the evil day, and, and we, need, we need to stand. So Paul's, Paul's calling here about in this, first, uh, this fourth chapter of Philippians. And we've been looking at these steps to stand in a stable place. I think I mentioned before that if you were to take a poll of the believers, if we were in church today and I were to ask for a show of hands, I would say that, that all of us as Christians, we want to be stable. We want to stand in a stable place. We, we don't want to be defeated. We don't, we don't want to get beat up. Nobody wants to get beat up. Nobody wants to get beaten down for that matter. Nobody wants to be depressed or discouraged or, or down in the dumps or no one likes falling victim to temptation, falling victim to sin, and no one uh, likes to be persecuted. None of us really enjoy any of that. None of us like uh, failing, falling, and being in those positions. We all want to be victorious in our Christian living. Sometimes we look at Paul, uh, and we think, is this guy even human? The amount of uh, attack and spiritual warfare against him and how he was able to stand stable in a stable place through all of that. So even though we want this and even though we understand that it's our call uh, in Scripture for us to stand fast and to be stable, the question still looms over us. In various times of our life, the question still looms over us, okay, I understand it. I know I want to be like this. I know the Bible's calling me to be like this, but How? How can I stand in a stable place? How can I stand fast in the Lord? How can we get the victory as believers? How can we not be depressed 
and not be discouraged with everything going on around us? How can we remain calm amidst all of this chaos and this catastrophe and this calamity and all of these things that come against us? So here we find ourselves in Philippians chapter 4. Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he's going to tell us. He's going to tell us how we can stand in a stable place. He's going to go through some steps to that. And the, for the key phrase I want us to look at, and we've looked at this every week, is this. In verse 1, Paul says, So stand fast in the Lord. That's a command, by the way. It's a military term that Paul's using there. And <clears throat> he's, he's saying, I want you to stand against doubt. You need to stand against temptation. You need to stand against trials. You need to stand against all of these this tribulation, these tests. Because the persecution that's coming your way, I need you guys, so stand fast in the Lord. You need to stand. So he uses the word so, which I mentioned means thusly or in this way. So Paul is going to give you the command, stand fast in the Lord. And when he says so, he's going to give you the list of things. And now he's going to go through these steps, and that's what we've been looking at. I want us to, <coughs> excuse me, to uh, just review again these steps. We should commit them to memory, and we should know their uh, scriptural counterpart. The first step to standing fast in the Lord, standing in a stable place, is harmony in the house. Paul, in verse 1, he talks about this, this, uh, the need to stand fast. And you can see Paul's love for the church. Look at the words he uses. He says, my, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for. He calls that church my joy and, and crown. And then again, he calls them dearly beloved. There's a love. And, we, and that's how we have what we need to have in our churches. We need to have harmony in the house. Paul's concern here in verses two and three is about this this lack of harmony as he as he brings to to bear the situation with these two women, Eodius and Syntyche, and they're having a, a little disagreement. Actually, it's probably a pretty big disagreement, one that Paul thinks is probably uh, has the uh, capability of, of uh, splitting the church. So he beseeches, he he begs them. He says he he beseeches them in verse. Two, look that they be of the same mind in the Lord. That's that they be in harmony. That they that they have harmony in the house. And look in verse three, he he gets the church to help. Why does he get the church to help? Because he knows when you when your church harvests uh, an environment of, of harmony, when you know there's accountability, when you know there's love, and we love each other in our in our churches, and we're praying for each other, and there's not gossip, and and there's not anyone sowing discord, and when when there when that church uh, when a church harvests an environment of harmony. Stability, in, individual stability comes out of that. When there's stability in the church, it produces stability amongst the people in the church. But if there's a church where there's cracks and there's fissures and there's, and there's uh, discord being sown all over the place, it creates a very unstable environment. It creates insecurity. It breeds insecurity amongst its members. And, and we need to be peacemakers. We need to harvest harmony in our church. The Bible says, Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers. We need an environment of peace. The second step was to uh, was this. In verse 4, Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. So step two is rejoicing is required. Harmony in the house and rejoicing is required. Paul says, look, it's a command. Rejoice. But you can't rejoice in your circumstances. At least most of us can't all of the, the majority of the time. Paul says rejoice in the Lord. We can always rejoice in the Lord. Our circumstances change. From day to day, sometimes from minute to minute, sometimes from hour to hour, our circumstances change. And if you put your, your joy, if you're rejoicing in the circumstances around you, you'll end up in a very unstable situation because you're putting your, your, you're basing your joy upon what's, uh, what's going on around you. The Lord never changes. He's the same today, yesterday, and forever. And we can rejoice in the Lord. Our circumstances, they'll come and they'll go. But God never changes our Lord never changes. So we have, to, we have to learn to rejoice in the Lord. We're commanded, not just learn, we're commanded to it. I mean, uh, we've said it every week, but how can you command a, uh, how can you command an, an emotion? Well, I mean, you must rejoice. But Paul gives us the key to that. You must rejoice in the Lord. And, and for a believer who knows God and who knows uh, Christ and who, 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 who spends time in his word, it's not, Difficult at all to rejoice in the Lord, to rejoice in the Lord. The third step Paul gives us then, there's harmony in the house. Rejoicing is required. These are steps. You write these down. The third step is 
Humility in the heart, Paul says in verse 5, let your moderation be known unto all men. That word moderation that Paul's talking about, it means uh, learning to accept less than what you think you deserve. It's humility. You can call it forbearing. You can call it being content. You can call it humble graciousness, or as most of the commentators say, a sweet reasonableness. But it's an attitude that we have of somebody who's seeking nothing. So that when we get nothing, we're not concerned. If we're, if we're expecting nothing and learn to accept less than what we deserve, then when it doesn't come, it won't throw us into a state of uh, instability. We'll be able to understand that it's not about us, it's about God. I, I'm not, look, I'm not seeking anything. I'm learning to accept less than I deserve. I'm very humble in my, in my heart. I'm content in whatever situation God has. I'm not asking, I'm not, I'm not demanding anything from anybody. It's all about Christ. So when you don't get what you think you deserve, when you're not recognized, uh, when you're not put up on a pedestal, when you're, uh, the work you've done happen, may go unnoticed for whatever reason, when you're uh, left off a list, when you're, whatever the case may be. So many people uh, get upset and get their feathers ruffled in churches. I've seen it so many times. Somebody forgets something. Somebody forgets to mention something. Somebody forgets to honor. The, I mean, whatever the case, I mean, things happen. And the thing is, if, if, if our uh, stability is based upon how others react to us, no, no, we'll be in a very unstable place. We need to learn to accept less than what we deserve. Humility. So when we get nothing, well, you heard the expression, uh, when you least expect it, well, that just should be it. When you least expect it, you got it. <laughs> learn to accept less you deserve humility in the heart the fourth step a sure-footed faith in verse 5 and 6 Paul goes on he says that uh, the Lord's at hand there at the end of verse 5 and he says be careful for nothing the word careful by the way means uh, don't be anxious don't worry don't be fearful we've preached several messages in, excuse me I dropped my glasses we've reached we preached several messages in the gospel of, of from uh, uh, Luke chapter 12 and Jesus is about worrying, and we, those messages were called, wor uh, Why Worry? But Paul tells us here, again, it's a command. Uh, be careful for nothing. We looked at the fact that the Lord is at hand. What do you, what, what, when we know the Lord's there, we know the Lord is at hand. And, and again, we talked about how that could have that word at hand. Uh, we equate that to being near. And things can be near in, in matters of time, and things can be near in matters of distance. I mentioned, um, uh, that we know that uh, uh, the inauguration day is near. It's near in time. And I could say that this, this coffee mug is, is near in terms of, of its location. And uh, as believers, we know that uh, Paul probably writing here says the Lord, uh, the Lord is at hand. Could be referring very much to the imminent rapture and the return of Jesus Christ. But uh, knowing the Holy Spirit dwells inside of us and knowing uh, where God is, the fact is uh, where the Lord is, the Lord is near us. He, he's near us. So if the Lord's near, if you know your God, if you understand who God is, if you have a good understanding of who God is, that's why we study his word. That's why we don't just preach uh, Hallmark card titles. And that's why we don't just make preach all feel good sermons. When you dig into the word of God and you get, and we learn what God's word has to say about him, when we understand who God is. We understand that this God uh, who the Bible describes to us, who he, he describes him, himself to us in his word. We understand who this God is, and we realize that the Lord is near. If we understand who God is, why would we ever worry when we understand who, who this God is? The Lord's at hand. Be, be careful for nothing. We need to be, be sure-footed in our faith. We need to, I remember back to the, the shield of faith we talked about. It's an unwavering uh, uh, stance and, and trust in, in God and who he says he is and who his word says he is. We need to have a sure footing of faith. If we have a sure footing of faith of who God is, that command to be careful for nothing and don't worry is, is easily obtainable if we understand who God is. The Lord's at hand. He's right there. He's right there. It says in God's word, he looked... You can see, look down through the clouds. He, we look up to him, and he's he's right there. You know, a lot of times through modern science and these billions of millions of miles and the ever expanding galaxy, we, you know, it, it, what it's done in, in many cases uh, it, it, is it's pushed God further and further and further and further away. And we think of Bab, we think of uh, in the Garden of Eden. He came down to walk in the garden to walk in the cool of the day. And in in Genesis, he talks about um, looking down and seeing what was going on in Bab when he came down. 
God's right there. He's near. He's near. He's near in terms of his time. If you look around us, the signs are all there. The next thing on the prophetic table is for you to hear a trumpet sound and the, the sky is going to crack open and Christ is going to call his church home. The Lord's near in time. It's coming, and he's near in, in, in location as well. So we need to have a sure-footed faith, and we have that sure-footed faith in, in who God is and in what his word says about him and his promises. Why would we ever worry if we understand that the Lord is near? The fifth step uh, that we talked about last week, and this is where we're going to park a little bit today, is uh, you see in the rest of verse 5, Paul says, um, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Fifth step that Paul gives us. It's a hard step. The steps actually get harder, I think, as you as Paul goes through them here in Philippians. And we'll see that here in the next couple of weeks as we close out this, this series. But this fifth step is this. Be thankful in the thick of it. Thankful in the, in, in the, in the thick of it. To be in a stable place, standing in a in a a stable place spiritually. It requires that we react to problems around us uh, with thankful prayer. Paul says in verse 6, back there, he says, be careful for nothing. He says, stop worrying. Matter of fact, we'll continue. Instead of worrying about things, why don't you pray? That's what Paul says there. But don't stop there. Let's, let's kind of raise the bar a little bit. But uh, don't just pray, but how about this? Pray with thanksgiving. Pray with thanksgiving. How about going to God with a thankful heart. You show me a person has peace, and a person that uh, has joy in the Lord, not their surroundings, a person who's, who's humble, a person who uh, trusts in God and truly believes in God and who he is, and a person who is thankful in everything. And you're going to look at somebody, you're going to show me a person that, that meets all that criteria, who's standing in a stable place. And this is where kind of we left off last week. And we, you already know the result of it. I'm going to remind you of it again today. But I just want to do a side note here about praying with thanksgiving. I want to kind of challenge you here today, this morning. I want to challenge you about being uh, going to God with thankful prayer. If we really understand what we're going through, then we should be thankful. I know you're saying, Pastor, what are you talking about? That's crazy. Yeah, I mean, if, we real, if we rightly understand what we're going through, then we should be thankful. I, I want to talk about this this morning because I want to challenge us with this. I want you to think about this. No matter what persecution we've gone through, no matter what trial, no matter what temptation that we've been put through or, or tribulation that we've been through, I want us to think about a couple things. First, first, we can be thankful in that, in that God has a purpose, Right? God has a plan. God is a, accomplishing some purpose. You have to understand this, right? Romans says about all things working together for good according to, the, to uh, those who are called, are called according to his purpose. God has a purpose. So no matter what we're going through, if we understand God, if we understand what we're really going through, we know that, that everything we go through, God has a purpose. So we should be thankful that God has a purpose. Can you imagine if God didn't have a purpose and we were just going through all of these trials and tribulations with, with, with no rhyme or reason and things were just really up? I mean, some people go through life like that. They just get hit with one wave after another wave and they don't know what to do and they, they find it very hard to come up for air. But we know as believers, if we understand who God is, if we rightly uh, understand what we're going through and who God is, we know we can be thankful that God has a purpose for what we're going through. Secondly, not only does God have a purpose, we can be thankful for the purpose. We can be thankful for the perfection, for the perfecting, because we know from Scripture that through every trial and tribulation, every temptation we go through, through every difficulty, uh, God is conforming us more and more uh, to be like His Son. So there's a perfecting. It's a perfecting of our faith. James talks about that, about when we go through these trials. So that we can be thankful that He has a purpose. Right? No matter what we're going through, we know that God has a purpose. We may not understand what that purpose is, but we understand from his word that we believe is, that is true, and we understand his word, and God has a purpose. Not only does God have a purpose, but God perfects us through these difficult times. And, and third, I want to say, like, we can be thankful for God's provision, right? 
We hear that word all the time, but God does provide Jehovah Jireh. If you're in our Sunday school classes, I encourage you to be there when we have them in the morning. We're going over the names of God. And one of those, I think the very third or fourth week, we were talking about Jehovah Jireh, my provider. God is our provider. God, there's a provision of God that we can be thankful for because that in everything we can be content because God will supply all our needs according to his riches and glory. God will provide for us. God will provide. So uh, through it all, through these difficulties, it lets God in those times of difficulty prove his word that he will provide for you. So there, uh, we see that there's a purpose. We can be thankful for the purpose. We can be thankful that God perfects us through all these trials and tribulations. And, and third, we can be thankful for his provision that God will provide. And fourth, just the promise that God gives us all through his word. Right, the God that, that's that's caring for us, the God that provides, the God that is perfecting us, and the God that's caring for us now is the same God in whom we have hope. That will one day, uh, when we pass on into this next life, when Christ calls us church, and there's a hope that we have that we will be forever, uh, we'll receive our glorified bodies, and we'll be in His eternal presence of Christ. Think about that. So there's, we can be thankful for His promises, thankful for His provision He's going to provide, thankful for His perfecting work that he has and thank you for his purpose. Now, I know all that's easier said than done, but in the middle of our trial, you can be thankful knowing that your God has a purpose, knowing that your God is going to use the trials and, and the triumph of your faith to perfect to perfect you, accomplish what he wants to do in your, in your life. And you can be thankful that he's going to provide all during, all during that process. And you can be thankful that we get just a glimpse of what that uh, glory is going to be like. We see God, his promises coming true. So we need, we need to, church, we need to learn to be thankful. And if you really know and understand who God is, and if we really understand, we really know that he's working all this out in his providential plan, we can be thankful in the thick of it. Might not want to be thankful in the thick of it, but our flesh is going to, is going to want to take it uh, and, and, and not do that. But you can be thankful uh, in the thick of it. Now, I want to just look at the illustration there real quick. This is kind of all the stuff I, I left out of last Sunday, but I want us to think of Jonah. Jonah is, is a, a great example, a great good illustration, I should say, of, of this being thankful in the thick of it. Y'all remember uh, Jonah. And the story of, of Jonah. And Jonah, by the way, found himself, I would believe, in, in some very dire straits. Matter of fact, when he tried to run from God uh, and not go where God told him to go, I believe Jonah thought he was in dire straits, but he had no idea what was about to uh, be unleashed on him. Jonah was in a, in a pretty bad way, right? You've heard the expression. I, actually, I had a, a plaque, uh, a picture that I had. I've had it for years, and I, I used to well, I like sharks and and there was a picture of a, of a fisherman's leg, and it was uh, uh, just sticking up, and it was kind of like a inside of a great white mouth, there was a little, little leg sticking out, and the, and the sign was a plaque, and it had like some boat rope around it, and it said, some days you eat the fish, some days the fish eat you. Now, I'm not trying to make light of that situation, but this is exactly the predicament that Jonah was in. He was eaten by a fish. He, he ran from God. He ended up being in a terrible storm. He jumped overboard, and he gets eaten Swallowed by a whale. Swallowed by a whale. So let's turn to Jonah chapter two, verse one. If you if you got your Bibles, I just want to look at I just want to go through this story real quick here with Jonah. This illustration. This uh, I wouldn't really call it a story. This is a these are actual events. The word of God is true. Uh, so let's go here to uh, Jonah chapter two, two verse one. And the chapter starts off. Jonah. The Bible says this just so simply. It says, "Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God." out of the fish's belly. Now, if you or I were in the stomach of a whale, we got swallowed by a fish, what would our prayer be like? Would we uh, pray unto the Lord as God out of the fish's belly? We'd probably be crying and screaming and pleading, Lord, why are you doing this? Why me, Lord? Where are you? You're not here. Where have you gone? What's happening? Why? Why? But that's not Jonah's approach, by the way. As we look here in, in, in just this chapter two, I'm going to roll right through this chapter. I mean, Jonah had to be aware of where he was, that he was floating in the belly of a whale. 
In verse two, he says, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell, cried I, and thou heardest my voice. For thou hadst cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about, and all thy billows and thy waves passed over me. I mean, jo Jonah's just painting the picture here of just sinking to the bottom of the, of the ocean. In verse four, Jonah says, Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward the holy temple. Jonah's like, I'm cast out of your sight. I'm so far gone. I'm so far down here in the in the in this ocean. Lord, you're not even going to see me. You don't even know I'm down here. You don't even know where I am, God. Jonah keeps going. He says, I will look again toward thy holy temple. Verse 5, the waters com compassed me about, even to the soul. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee, into my holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. Here, verse 9, look. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. He says, I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I, I heard one uh, commentator say this. There's one thing that a giant fish can't stand. A giant fish can't stand a thankful prophet. Because right after this, we see what happened. Uh, the whale vomited Jonah out in verse 10. So here's, here's a guy in Jonah who, who is in the most dire straits. Totally unthinkable, very traumatic. You find yourself in those same kind of situations. I find myself uh, certainly not being swallowed by a fish, but we find ourselves in dire circumstances. We find ourselves with all kind of crises upon us. But the fact uh, of Jonah, what he says here about he will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. You know, Jonah wasn't perfect. I mean, he ran from God. He had a lot of other issues he had to, he had to work out. But just this statement where he says, I, I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving kind of shows us a great amount of spiritual stability that Jonah has. And then he says, salvation is, is of the Lord. There was never a wavering uh, bone in, in Jonah's body, except when God told him to go to Nineveh originally. <laughs> but when it came to his God, there was no wavering bone in his body. It was never, uh, Jonah never worried or wavered in, in, in uh, God's ability to deliver if God chose to do so. That's the key for us. If God chooses to do it, we never have any doubt. Because Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego in the, in the fiery furnace, and they, there was no doubt in their mind that God would deliver if he chose to do so. Let's go back to Philippians 4 here real quick. Paul says, if you pray like that, Paul says, if you pray like that, this is the result. Think of Jonah again, Jonah in the belly of a whale, uh, which, we could, which we could use an application of our, some of our most dire moments that we're in. When things, not just when things aren't going good, not when the car breaks down, not when, when the weather's bad, not, nothing like that. But we're in some dire circumstances. There's an illness, when there's a diagnosis, when there's calamity, when there's chaos. And we feel like we've been swallowed up and we're sinking to the bottom of the ocean when we're, when we're, that, when we're in that kind of position. Look, Jonah says, can we be like Jonah? And he says, I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. That's being thankful in the thick of it. Back to Philippians 4, I'm sorry. So Paul says, if you pray like that, if you pray with thanksgiving, because you're, you're, you're sure-footed in your faith, there's a result. We talked about that result last week, and the result is in verse 7. I want us to get this, because, man, this is like God giving you the, the, the answer right here to worry, giving you the answer to anxiety, giving you the, anxiety, the answer to depression, the, the, the answer to all of that. He says, look, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Here's the result. Look, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. There's a result. The peace of God, not just peace. God's not just going to send peace. It's going to be his peace, the peace of God. It's going to bring tranquility. It's going to bring contentment. It's going to bring, uh, basically, it's going, it's going to console us beyond human reasoning. Remember I mentioned last week that I had my heading on my outline titled, if I, if I read this 
I want to explain my next point, but if I explain it to you, you're not going to understand it. <laughs> because that's what the Bible says. It says that the peace of God, which passes all understanding, We can't even understand it. We can't understand how when we follow these steps and when to, to being in a stable place and we, we line up our lives with harmony, there's harmony in the house and there's, we're rejoicing in the Lord. We're, we're, we understand that and we're doing that. We're living out humility in the heart and we're, we're living out that our sure-footed in faith and trusting in God and who he is and really understanding having that, a sure-footed faith about who God is and then we're going to go to him and we're going to be uh, thankful in the thick of it and everything go to God in, in prayer and, and with thanksgiving and look and because of that God is going to send his peace which passes all understanding you're not going to be able to understand it other people around you and your family they're not going to understand why you have that peace people of the lost world when they look at you are going to look at you like you're crazy Rome is burning how, how can you be doesn't anything shake you he said no, I'm in a stable place God's going to send his peace, which passes all understanding. When we pray for our brothers and sisters and, and, and friends and family who, who lose loved ones and they go through grief and they go through mourning, which is a very normal process. The Bible says, blessed be those that mourn, they're going to be comforted. But look at that comfort. That comfort's the peace of God. You're going to God in thankful prayer. And God's going to send a peace that passes all understanding. God, God's the comforter. Look, it gets better. He says it's going to pass all comprehension, but more Something more to note here is it says, look at that last half of that verse 7, and it shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I mentioned last week that word keep is a military term again. The people in, in, Philip, in uh, Philippi were very familiar with the Roman garrisons. Matter of fact, we think of the story of the, the Philipp, uh, Philippian jailer and, the, and, the, and when the, the cells broke open and Paul and Silas were there. And the, of course, we see that basically I think that's the beginning of the Philippian church when the jailer says, well, what must I do to be saved? The Roman soldiers, the garrisons, people in, in, at the Church of Philippi were very familiar with the scene. And Paul uses this military term, keep, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That's, that's a military term that means guard or guarded by a sentinel. So basically, when you go to God in thankful prayer, when you're in a stable place, when you're following these steps to a stable place and, you, and you're not worrying about anything and you're going to God in uh, letting your request be made known, but you're going to him and being in, in, in thankful in prayer, look, Look, he's going to give you, he's going to send you his peace. And God's peace is going to guard your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. You're going to have the sentinel of God's peace guarding your heart. Guarding it from what? From worry. Guarding it from fear. Guarding it from anxiety. Mm. Peace of God guarding your heart. Thankful in the thick of it. Harmony in the house. Rejoicing, it's required, it's a command. Humility in your heart, learn to expect less than you deserve. A sure-footed faith, a kind of faith that knows who God is. And when you are faithful, like Jesus said when, the, when, the, uh, when he was talking about uh, not worrying, he said, oh, ye of little faith. If you have a sure-footed faith, you'll be careful for nothing. You won't be anxious over anything. But yet you're going to go to God and let your request be made known and go to him in thankful prayer. And he's going to send a peace that you're going to be thankful in the thick of it. And he's going to send you a peace which passes all understanding. You're not even going to be, you're not even going to be able to understand this peace that God's going to send. And it's going to guard your heart from worry and guard your heart from fear and guard your heart from anxiety. When you live a kind of life uh, uh, following those steps to stand in a stable place. No one's going to knock you off balance. No one's going to topple you over. But Paul isn't done. There's a few steps left. To be exact, there's two steps left here as we go through to verse 9. We're not going to get to them today. We're going to start hopefully in church next, uh, next Sunday. We're going to hit these. These are the two hardest steps of all. As I mentioned, these steps get higher as they go along. They get, they're a little harder to obtain. And they are at the end of this passage. So next week, we're going to go into verse 8. And we're going to go to the spiritual, the steps to a stable place, the last two steps. Uh, next week, we'll deal with the next one in verse 8. But we need, to be th we need to learn to be thankful in the thick of it. It's a requirement. Staying in a, in a spiritually stable place is going to require us to go to the Lord and, re and respond to what's going on around us with thankful prayer. Father, thank you for this day and everything you've given us. I thank you for your word. Father, I pray the Holy Spirit is led into all truth. Father, I pray that uh, 
as we dig into your word, preach from the truth of your word, Lord, that, that it encourages our hearts and our minds to grow in the grace and knowledge and to dig into your word as individuals at home and spend time learning these principles and following over these steps you've given us to be in a stable place. Lord, I pray for all those that uh, on our prayer list this morning. Lord, I pray for those that need comforting, for those that are dealing with illness. Father, I pray for our church. I thank you for the faithfulness of those that attend. Thank you for the faithfulness of those to give. Lord, again, we're just so grateful for all that you've given us. Lord, I pray you bring us uh, together on Thursday. We ask all this in Jesus' name we pray. One more thing I want to mention before we close is that starting this Wednesday at 7 p.m., it will be the first, the opening night, we're going to kick off uh, the ladies' uh, women's Bible study on suffering from 1 Peter. Uh, Delaney will be uh, heading up that Bible study. I, ple I encourage uh, everyone in our church, all the ladies in our church, to come out and uh, for a time of fellowship and, and digging into God's Word about suffering. Everything we've gone through here, everything we're going to continue to go through, uh, it's a wonderful lesson on what, what God's Word has to say for suffering and how God uses all of that to perfect us. And also uh, on the 26th, Tuesday the 26th, uh, next week, by the way, that Bible study will go every Wednesday at 7, probably through March, and then we'll look at what we're going to do next. But uh, And then the following week, Tuesday, January 26th, will be uh, uh, Ladies uh, Fellowship, Ladies Meeting. It'll be at 7 p.m. at the church. So I encourage uh, all you ladies to come out for the Ladies Meeting as well. We, we would be very happy if there was something going on every night at our church. We want to uh, uh, get together and encourage one another, provoke one another to good works, as Hebrews 10, 20. That's the real purpose of, of church, by the way. Uh, so I hope to see, I uh, hope, hope that we have a good turnout for uh, the Bible study and for the ladies' meeting. We'll see you on Thursday at 7 p.m. as we continue our study in Ephesians.